which is a great opportunity to pivot over to the other item you already mentioned, which is pension fraud. Yeah. <laughs> where I, I kind of love the section where you talked about like the last six, seven Confederates, supposed Confederates that get yeah. married are not even Confederates, or you have individuals that by their own definition should be 130 years old. Yeah, which the, the last 12 Confederate veterans, this is something that uh, Marvell figured out in the 90s, actually. He figured out that the last 12, at least, um, Confederate veterans are not, conf weren't Confederate veterans. These guys, they die and they're the last, oh, we're going down to four Confederate veterans. None of them are Confederate veterans. What? So the last Confederate reunion has no Confederate veterans. Right. You, have, you have these like three or four guys sitting around a table all hoping that no one like no, outs well, them as they're the fake, right? Like they're all like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember that. Oh yeah. I mean, it must have been a fascinating conversation. I don't know how many of them were senile or what, but but they were they're all faking it, and they all know they're faking it. They'd all been born like either at the beginning of the war or right after, and and a lot of these guys are still remembered as the last Confederate. And for every last Confederate veteran who got a pension and died at ninety while claiming to be one hundred and ten, yeah, how many more died when they were eighty? claiming to be 90 right like so as you start shifting back it's hard you know you start realizing that these guys are just the ones that lasted a long time mm -hmm. right these guys are the ones that last a long time or never there's a found. whole nother set of them that are sort of missed that and this is where i think what's really fascinating is that it's a lot and it's not just guys who are lying about their age it's guys who are lying about their service now technically you weren't supposed to get a confederate pension if you deserted or if you didn't serve a certain number of months, or if you had certain wealth, there's a lot of reasons. But what we find is that a lot of these guys who, they literally, we know from military, war, from wartime records, that these guys either deserted, mm -hmm. um, blatantly and never returned, fled to the Union lines and took the oath of allegiance, or in some cases, joined the United States military, uh -huh. um, and actually are become what we call galvanized Yankees, um, and they go out west to fight Native Americans, basically, mm -hmm. and to control the border is the agreement. And and there are literally individuals who are applying for Confederate pensions at the same time as they're applying for U.S. pensions. Uh, and they know that in both cases that they are ineligible because of their actions that they're applying for for the other one, right? And so in, in one case, one guy, he goes to different county clerks. He goes to one county to apply for his Confederate pension and another county mm. apply for his federal pension because he needs them to sign, he needs the county clerk to notarize the document. And so what we see when we sort of look at um, all of these, this pension fraud is that they're never questioned and that the issue is not whether they're telling the truth or not, it's whether or not they will vote a certain way, whether or not they are undermining the lost cause or not. So if you're up there saying, I was a Confederate veteran, but I didn't want to fight, you might lose your pension. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're up there and you never fought, but you're like, I was a brave Confederate, they're like, all right, you're, you're fulfilling the mission of the lost cause yeah. and you're promising to vote the way I want you to vote. Um, and so you have, um, it serves white supremacy in a variety of ways from being political patronage, you know, mm -hmm. if you vote the way I want you to, we'll give you money, to also being the narrative that is propagated leads to this expectation. So you have these individuals who they literally desert within a month. So they're ineligible because you had to serve at least a certain number of months, right? And because they deserted, they literally take up arms against the Confederate troops when they round up their siblings to try to force them into back into the military and they free them while armed. So they're taking up guns against the Confederacy. And when they die, their obituary says Confederate veteran, uh, you know, dies and it's, all, you know, and so they erase their own history. And that's why we don't, and I think in part, this contributes to why we don't have a real uh, white unionist memory of the war. And it's something in another place where I think there's further studies to be done. And I really want to see more, more work done on this um, going forward is I think we do need to have a better sense of why don't we remember unionists? Why are unionists forgotten? Remember, 100,000 white Southerners fought for the United States military. That's larger than the Army of Northern Virginia at its largest. Yeah. That is a massive movement of manpower. If we include African Americans from the South who fight, you're looking at a quarter million yeah. Southerners who are moving their manpower from supporting the Confederacy theoretically, right, potentially, mm -hmm. their potential manpower, whether it's military manpower or labor, in the case of enslaved people, um, that are suddenly moving over to the other side. And so we were looking at, you know, what, I don't know, 15% of the United States military by the end of the war yeah. um, or something like that, over 10 um, is going to be Southerners. Um, and that's 
So it's not really a sectional conflict, only it's also a, a conflict that's uh, within the South. And, and why are they forgotten? And, and I think part of it is, is money um, in some cases, um, is that there's, um, and it's not just the guys who join the Union Army, it's guys who desert and hide in the bush, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the troops are literally pulled away in March of 1865. They have to send an entire unit to central, from the front up in Virginia. They have to take them out of the lines and send them to North Carolina to suppress dissenters and deserters and accusing conscripts who are causing problems in the Piedmont. And we don't even usually talk about the Piedmont as a place of dissent. We talk about the Appalachians, but the mm -hmm. Piedmont has it as well. And so when you start seeing that, uh, it starts to raise these questions of how do they get forgotten? And I, mm -hmm. think, I think part of the reason is because the lost cause was used to unite whites politically in the early 20th century and pensions serve that role. So pensions are not only causing this narrative, they're a way of uniting whites under a common narrative, which leads to them voting a certain way. 